Age of Sigmar is the bravest fantasy IP of the modern age, and before it even launched, it was doomed. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't want to be playing this game. This should be a video about how Games Workshop destroyed a huge part of their business. Instead, I'll tell you how the game was rescued from oblivion, how that mirrors its own story, and how it went on to influence the largest tabletop game in the world, Warhammer 40,000. I'm also gonna tell you about the lore, the game, and what the community is like. But don't forget, you're not meant to be here. We're not meant to be here. I'm not sure I'm meant to be here, let's be honest. <laughs> Age of Sigmar was created from the ashes of a 30-year-old IP called The Old World. Well, I guess Warhammer Fantasy. You may know it from the incredibly popular Total War Warhammer franchise. 30 years is a lot of time to have spent developing background and lore for a game system and IP. So Creative Assembly, who make Total War Warhammer, must have been really excited to have most of that work done for them to launch such an incredibly successful game. The same applies for Warhammer Vermintide, another incredibly popular game based off the old world lore. Games Workshop, however, thought, this is useless. We don't need this. Let's blow it up. In wargaming terms, this is the same as stopping all Marvel movies at the point when Thanos did the snap. There was anger. There was confusion and there was silence. At the time, Games Workshop didn't have a social media presence. This was in the dark ages of 2015. It wasn't, it was not long ago. People were confused. What was gonna happen to their lovingly crafted armies? What was gonna happen to the story and lore that they invested so much time, money and effort in for maybe 30 years? Then, bam, Age of Sigmar was born. Now, let's leave this here and do a quick overview of what Age of Sigmar is actually like. Age of Sigmar is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's a tactical game or a narrative game. It's an exciting lot of lore that you can get lost into. And it's a place for artistic expression, whether that be through world building or painting or building something really creative with the lore IP miniatures or anything else really. It's a fantastic hobby. And if you're excited about getting into it, this is definitely the video for you. A short explanation of the game is that it's toy soldiers with dice. 26 armies, but with like dragons and like mushroom adored goblins. And an average game takes about three hours. In this video, I'm mainly gonna be focusing on the lore and the gameplay, mainly because I want you to play games of Age of Sigmar. It's what I love to do most, and so that's what I'm gonna be concentrating on. You can play with your friends at home or even go to events and become a world famous player. In fact, you can even represent your national team like some of these people. Oh, hi there. It's Matthew Goldsborough for Team Wales. To start this wacky hobby, you are going to need this prop that I found, the core rulebook. <laughs> Chunky, like your favorite Age of Sigmar YouTuber. If you are new or even coming from a different game system, this has got everything that you need. And I really do encourage you to get it. It's got all the history of the universe and the setting. However, if you don't want to read it and you want a quick one minute lore recap, let's go. The old world, a European themed fantasy world, was destroyed by chaos. The last vestige held in the god Sigmar's hand tumbled with him through space until a dragon found him and breathed life into his cold body. They became mates. Dracothian, the imaginatively named dragon, told Sigmar of eight realms floating in space that were free to explore and conquer. Sigmar gentrified them all and made cities, got loads of humans, elves and dwarves to move in, and all was good. He created a council of all the other gods, which is not an allegory for the United Nations. This was the golden age. Then chaos attacked and took over nearly everything. The council disbanded and Sigmar ran away to his home in the realm of heaven. He was moody for a while, then created new soldiers from the stolen souls of heroes and fused with lightning to create the cops of the mortal realms. Opened up the realm gates, teleported the gold cops through and started to retake the chaos ridden lands. End of AOS 1. Age of Sigmar 2 was a time skip of a few hundred years with civilization returning to the realms, but chaos and other threats were arrayed against the forces of order. Nagash, the god of death, tried to enact a plan to take over all the realms, but some skaven wrecked it and now spells are real. In Age of Sigmar 3, the factions are more fleshed out. They narrowed down the focus of the story to one of the eight realms, the realm of beasts and monsters called Gur, and that 
that brings us up to date. Age of Sigmar is a mythic origin story involving present gods, monsters, titans, and mushroom creeps, and currently a tenuous civilization beset on all sides by danger. This next section is new to the Honest Wargamer. It is our ad section. Our ads are slightly different though to other people's ads because we do not take sponsorship. However, Patreon decided it would be good if they started writing ads so you could join them in the Discord and hang out on Patreon. So every time we make a video, there'll be a Patreon ad written by the Patreons and voted by the Patreons. I don't get any say in it, so here we go. The first bit says in a dramatic voice. In a world where one man needs your help to explain Age of Seeper. Okay, I enjoyed that bit. Dear YouTube, did you know I have a Patreon? Considering the amount of content on there, I should probably be promoting it more. So here I am, promoting it more. Help support the work I do here and on Twitch, and also get access to backstage content, interviews, and even STLs to help you game more better. -er. It's not funny. It's not funny. You'll also be helping me to defy the Catholic school teachers that'll tell, what? You'll also be helping me to defy the Catholic school teachers that told me I'd never make it. Help me to afford coffee with caffeine and sign up today. Okay, this is a terrible idea. We won't do this again. Age of Sigmar at launch had laughable lore. Or was it? To me, yes. To lots of other people, also yes. Compared to the old world or the very typical fantasy setting that we're in, it felt wacky and silly. And it was packaged as such. The art was in stark contrast to the gritty style of the old world. And instead, Age of Sigmar art was colorful, clean, and cartoonish. Age of Sigmar was something else. As a business pitch, it was bold and probably insane. Completely destroy a setting which people were invested in, both emotionally and financially, and replace it with something completely different and at odds with what it looked like. And the thing you're replacing it with, not even fully conceived. In this first Age of Sigmar, at the beginning, it was quite clear they had no idea what they were doing with many of the races. Also, they just didn't communicate about some of the races that they'd forgotten to put in the law, like Bretonia or Tomb Kings. Skaven were in chaos now? Dark Elves were somehow order? Where do people live? Where's the industry? Where are the farmers? And yet, the old world was a set of cultural and racial pastiches, which were sometimes Horatian and sometimes Juvenilian, but were just poorly hidden tropes, outright appropriation and poor referencing. It was a tower of cards built on Tolkien-based fantasy and was pretty bland in its uniformity to ideas that we already knew, which was good because it's something that we could instantly recognize. It's a very easy pitch you understand fantasy Germany. And did it have room to grow? Sure, we could have explored fantasy China or fantasy Arabia. But in the end, it was a reductive take on fantasy stereotypes. And <laughs> I loved it. I was really mad when they blew it up. At the start of the video, I said that Age of Sigmar was the bravest modern fantasy. It's taken a long time to build the universe and actually it's taken me a long time to form this opinion. Stripping away the safety net of trad fantasy has given the background writers and also the sculptors the creative space to build and create inside a what if universe. They have unlimited scope, not tied to one plane of reality or existence. They can explore, create and uncover new fantasy which they wouldn't have been able to do before. Not talking rehash, although yes, there are elves and dwarves, but the elves ride fish and live under the sea. So I guess they're like a little bit like the little mermaid. <laughs> Does anyone notice they're like the little mermaid? And the dwarves uh, are sky pirates that fly through the sky. I mean, where else are they gonna fly, Rob? That's ridiculous. Modern centerpiece miniatures definitely reference parts and cultures of the world, but they're very much their own pieces, more so than anything we saw in Warhammer Fantasy. Would we have even paid attention if it was released alongside the old world? Would people have even embraced the setting as it was launched, if not for the world's largest miniatures manufacturer blowing up their wildly valuable IP? I don't think so. I'd love to know what you think. Those chaotic and misguided fools burnt traditional ideas and worlds to the ground. As refugees, we entered these new worlds like the characters that came with us. It's a bold new world, challenging stereotypes, structure, and us, the audience. 
It's revolutionary, not by choice, by happenstance, but nonetheless, it's revolutionary. The core book also contains all the rules you'll need to play. These are also freely available online. And since this book launched, it's been FAQ'd. And you can find those digitally available online if you go onto warhammercommunity.com. The core book is to understand the setting. And it's great for that. At launch, the game had no points and was functionally unplayable. I know because I played it. One person, Mo, gave all of the units in the game points with an advisory council of people. They created missions which are exactly like the missions we play now and even introduced a bunch of generic secondaries. I don't think Mo knew this, and I think this only really works in retrospect, but this is literally the story of Sigma finding the lands, taming them and bringing civilization to a place that had none. But as we know from the story of Age of Sigma, chaos turned up. Games Workshop adopted the system that Moa created, repackaged it, and turned it into the first General's Handbook. Lauded as saving the game, as, well, a game, this adoption of a community set of rules vastly increased sales. For the first time, local gaming stores and communities started to pick up the game and run events. This has snowballed into a massive international community. It's kind of the people's game. Age of Sigmar is a monolithic beast pushed by a big corpo, but its roots are based on revolution, not intentional, sure, and also community development. The game itself also later inspired the launch of Warhammer 40,000 8th edition, which is seen as a massive improvement and has again skyrocketed both the game of Warhammer 40,000 and Games Workshop to greater and greater height. And there's something incredible about that, right? You destroy a thing, people create a thing inside the vacuum, and then this turns out to be an incredibly important and inspiring creative process. That means that we're all in a better place years down the line. I'm not really sure how to wrap up this part, but there's something there. There's a great story to be told one day about this. And I'm glad I got to share a part of it with you now. So now you've read all 360 pages of the core book, no cheating. Stop the video, do this first. Please don't stop the video. The most important thing that you can do before you decide to get into this hobby is work out what you want to achieve or what you have the time to achieve. You kind of need to know what you want to do before you start picking up army books and models and all those other things. Everyone is different. Everyone has a different background and they also have different wants. So I spoke to everyone on my Patreon and I asked them what they wanted when they first got into Age of Sigmar and generally wargaming themselves. There were some great answers, but this is kind of a summation of what people wanted. Just collect stuff and have a fun, cool hobby. Get super deep and really weird into the narrative. Uh, create their own custom armies and show them to people. Paint really well and maybe win some painting competitions. Play games really well and maybe win some gaming competitions. And lastly, and most importantly, having friends, making friends, and having fun. All of these are valid and I'm sure there are some that I've missed. And you can want to do several of them at once. Make new friends, win tournaments. Seems very fine. I mean, I don't know how you're going to find time for all these things, but maybe you can do all of it. But before you get into it any further, just work out what you want to do, what you have time for, what you think you can achieve, what your local community is like to do those things as well. It's all about managing expectations. Just have a think about what you want to achieve, what you want out of the hobby. It will make your journey in the hobby much more fun. So now it's time to pick the army that you want to emotionally invest in and maybe make your whole personality. There's a reason I look like this. It's my Chaos Dwarf beard. The next step is your army book, and these are called Battle Tomes. I've never really been sure if it's Battle Tome or Battle Tomb. Inside you'll find the lore, the background, and the rules for building your army. But which book should you choose? Which army should you choose? That's a great question. A lot of people base this on the aesthetics of the miniatures, the lore, or the strength of the rules. This process, though, omits the way the army normally plays, unfortunately. So we're going to go through all of the armies, and we're going to talk about the background, in short, and also quickly how the army plays, so you can decide if there's an army for you. 
Stormcast are indentured godly knights with a lightning kink. They have an elite, simple, resilient playstyle with the most options to play and collect. Sylvaneth are tree people who are the guardians of the forest and the natural world. They hate loggers, whereas I hate bloggers. They have a hit and run skirmish playstyle, transforming the board into a thicket of danger to whittle the opponent. The whittle bit is great. The Seraphon are dinosaurs ruled by magic frogs who live on spaceships, a hyper flexible army able to dominate all aspects of the game. The Cities of Sigmar are a metropolitan military wing of the denizens of the mortal realms. They have a random assortment of hyper-specialized units with overlapping synergies. The Daughters of Cain are Lady and Snake Lady Blood Elves, led by their treacherous twin-souled god queen, Marathi. They have Hyper Elite shooting all melee, with medium survivability and a monster leader that can't ever be killed in a turn. Fire Slayers are mostly naked Scottish lads who love fire and runes and avenging wrongs while riding magma dragons. They are a Hyper Elite melee army with a heavy focus on leader units and runic magic. The Ideth Deepkin are abandoned xenophobic elves of the sea riding tamed eels, sharks, and giant turtles. Ultra fast melee and shooting units with all calamari cavalry possible. Calamari cavalry, that's worth a subscribe. Caradron overlords are mercantile sky dwarf pirates and miners with steampunk aerial cities and loads and loads of guns. They are an ultra shooting army with airship troop transports. The Luminous Realm Lords are high value monastic magic elves integrated into nature with wicked outfits. Their playstyle is ultra synergistic magic and buffs on elite shooting and melee units. Blades of Corn are angry berserkers who worship and kill for the God of Blood. They are melee focused using slain units for special tricks and summoning demons. Maggot Kin of Nurgle are diseased, pus-filled warriors who worship the God of Decay. Ultra resilient, melee focused, and apply disease, which causes damage and summons demons. The Disciples of Zinch are magical bird people who worship and serve the god of sorcery. They are a spell casting castle gun line that summons demons and can pick the results of some dice rolls. The Heat Knights of Sinesh are servants of the Dark God dedicated to the pursuit of earthly gratification and the overthrow of all decent behavior. They have fragile melee or shooting units that summon demons by tempting you with dice. Saves of Darkness are armored Vikings who follow chaos, but aren't totally sure which god to worship. They're a melee focused force with god-based upgrades that you can mix and match. The Beasts of Chaos are primordial tribes of goats, cows, and nightmares, hell-bent on avoiding the barbecue and desecrating the world. They are a skirmish-focused army that ambushes the opponent and disrupts their plans. Skaven are sneaky, fratricidal steampunk rats addicted to warp crack and mad inventions. Their playstyle is a variety of shooting and melee mixed with and powered by magic. Nighthaunt are tormented and bitter spirits from the very real realm of death, hoping to murder everyone. They are a mobile melee focused army that ignores armor piercing and is impossible to pin down. Oceat Bone Reapers are a militaristic bone recycling necromantic tax collectors in service to the God of Death. They are an ultra resilient melee focused army with a really cool looking catapult. Soulbright Grave Lords are traditional necromantic vampires and werewolves leading skeleton warriors and zombies, with also a vampire centaur monster. They are a melee focused army with magical synergy creating fun and powerful combinations. The Fresh Eater Courts are delusional ghouls who think that they're high society but actually eat people. I guess it's like real high society. Fast and fragile melee units powered by dark magic with undead summoning. The Gloomspite Gits are mushroom obsessed goblins and trolls with lunatic pets that are mainly teeth. They have a fast powerful melee units with strong overlapping synergy and strong magic and vomiting trolls. Iron Jaws are angry green pastiches of English yob culture who love of fighting. They're orcs. That's, that's what orcs are. They are a hyperfast melee army with the ability to fight multiple times. The Cruel Boys are sneaky swamp orcs with poison weapons and trade accounts at the Chaos Dwarf Armory. They have hyper fragile units with high damage output in combat and melee powered by magic and potions. Boat Splitters are tribal and mystical orcs who love dancing, being naked, and hunting monsters while riding pigs. They're melee focused with some light shooting, but the main strength being lots of bodies and a madman with a murderous mask. The Ogre Moor tribes are big, huge, hungry lads, riding giant monsters and eating anything they see, including rocks. An army that is low model count, melee heavy with great shooting, and dangerously strong monster units. And last, and definitely least, the Sons of Behemoth are giants. 
They're melee focus monsters that stand on objectives, or they don't. Giants ruin the game for like a whole year, and they're terrible, they're just big babies. So before you pick up your book, here are some quick thoughts. Normally, the game and the story runs in a cycle called an edition. First edition was a simple four pages of rules, which left obviously loads and loads of gameplay questions and was about Sigmar taking back the realms from the forces of chaos. Second edition was much more advanced. We had summoning units for free. We had endless spells, thanks to Nagash trying to summon a Necroquake. And the story was about everyone trying to steal and capture your soul. Third and current edition is the most complex to date, introducing reactions, monstrous actions, and heroic actions, and a new way to score points to win. Up until the third edition, you basically stood on objectives to win the game, which is cool, and it created a very interesting gameplay, which is based around movement. The new way to score points are called battle tactics, which are like little quests that you do in each one of your turns to score points, and Age of Sigmar is about scoring points, and whoever scores the most points wins. At the time of recording, this video, the game is in the third edition, and they normally last for about three years. Pretty much every book gets a new army book or battle tome during an edition. But if you're not sure if the book that you're looking to pick up has got a new battle tome for this edition, then just ask around, people will be able to tell you. If you're only into the rules, then you can find all of them on a website called Wahapedia. Games Workshop doesn't actually sell digital versions of the rules. You have to buy a book, and then the book has got a code, and then you have to put that code into an app which is just a really asinine way of doing it. However, the rules are indexed incredibly well on Wirepedia, so if you'd like to find them all there, you can learn how to play and read all the rules for your units and armies, which is great. So what's the game like? Well, the game is a very complex mix of rock, paper, scissors, chess, and gambling. You normally play 2,000 point match play games. Each unit in the game is worth a certain amount of points, and you fill your army roster up until you get to 2,000 points. Each army has a different playstyle based on its narrative theme, which is cool. You use minis, a tape measure, some dice, this weird thing called a combat gauge, I'm already sure, tokens, or you absolutely street hammer it. 10 dice, a whippy stick, and no shirt on the streets. A warhammer was meant to be played. You play on a board that's 44, by 60 inches, normally on a mouse mat-like material with some really cool terrain. Or you could just play it on your floor at home with some cans and shoeboxes. It is a game of imagination. Abstraction, sure, because of the math and the gameplay. But what I like about it is that the game of imagination really reminds me of this video that they put out for PlayStation years ago. You may not think it to look at me. But I have commanded armies in conquered worlds. Holding objectives and doing battle tactics scores you points, and scoring points wins you the game. However, we're simulating a war. Sure, it's a war between fantasy armies, but it's a war nonetheless, and this is what makes it like chess. Destroying each other's pieces and units is a very viable way of making it so your opponent can't score points. So that's the chess part of the game. Trying to avoid having your stuff destroyed while destroying their stuff and scoring points. Also, each army plays a certain way. Sky Dwarfs fire their big guns from their ships and try to shoot anything that they can find. Zinch Wizards try to cast a load of spells and summon a lot of units to the board. This is a problem for the Zinch Wizards because their spellcasters are probably gonna get shot by the Sky Dwarves, meaning that they won't be able to win the way that they want to win. In this way, there is a complex and fascinating set of army lists and play styles that create this web of rock, paper, scissors. But it's more like arrow, spell, and like hammer to the face. Lastly, everything in the game is based on rolling six-sided dice. And these are bastards. This is the uh, emotional part of the game. It's emotional gambling. A six, yes! You're gonna be pretty mad at the dice, and you're also gonna be pretty happy with the dice. But in my opinion, the dice make it amazing. It's the kind of chaos energy that you can't really control. That RNG is something that some people don't like, but I think it's something that really makes the game exhilarating. A 2,000 point game takes about three hours to play, especially if you're playing at a tournament, but if you're playing with your friends, it could take up to five or six hours because you're just messing around and having a laugh, which is definitely the point. Have fun. That's the point. You're playing a game. The game lasts for five turns and has a priority-based system for who takes the turns. In some games, each player takes a turn and that continues. In Age of Sigmar, after both players have taken a turn, you roll a dice and whoever wins gets to choose who goes first. That is the priority roll. That's how turn-based priority works. Some people don't like it. 
I really love it. In fact, recently a new player got into it and I discussed it with him in this video if you'd like to go check it out. The game is also pretty complex. If you're looking for a game that you want to get into that you only play once a year, then I think that this is a game that requires a lot of study and hard work to be able to truly enjoy. That doesn't mean that you can't get into it, and I never want to stop you from doing something you want to do, but it is very complicated, and that's kind of okay, because you can get really weird and really deeply into it, but if it's something you can only commit a certain amount of time to, then you're probably not gonna have as much fun as if you could commit more time to it. Like they say, practice isn't sexy, but once you practice enough, well, you can jazz, man. I would describe the game as pretty easy to pick up, but incredibly hard to master. So what are the people like who play and are involved in the game, and I guess all of the hobby? In short, they're welcoming, fun, and very engaging. Some of my best friends I found playing Age of Sigma, and it's had a profound effect on my life because I've got to meet such amazing people. And that's not just England. I've traveled all around the world meeting people from the Age of Sigma community, and they're great. It's very heavily skewed in the white male 20 to 60 category, as I think quite a lot of nerd stuff is, but that's changing, which in my opinion is a massive positive. There's the usual online discourse, which goes from fun to fighting, depending on which one you prefer. There are great YouTube videos, battle reports, podcasts, lore videos, all to accompany you while you're painting and building your armies to go and meet people at events. The game really is a vehicle for doing my favorite thing, which is meeting new people either online or in person. There's a thriving event scene around the world. You can compete in solo events, you can double up with a partner and do doubles, or you can join a team and teams of four, six, or eight compete at big events against other teams. Age of Sigmar event attendance has grown massively and far eclipses its meager beginnings. There isn't a central database of where these clubs or events are, but that does sound like a really fun project for me and the team to take on. So if you'd like to go to events or even just start playing, go to your local gaming store or just ask online. Just keep harassing people. What's interesting is, is you might not think this, but people really wanna play with you. If you're new, people are really excited to find new players and play with them. The reason I know this is because I was recently at an event with some of the most successful players in the world at an event called CastleCon, and I asked a couple of people what it was like to play new players and how they felt about it. You would normally think that competitive high-end tournament gamers would not be very keen to play people who aren't new. Let's see what they said. Do I like playing against a new player at a GT? Absolutely. It's my favorite people to play against, not because I'm going to win, but because I feel I can mold their, or, you know, shape their experience in a positive way, whether or not they win. Because, I, you know, I played, I played 40K, drank for a, a long time, was not good at it. Came over to AOS, was not good at it. Um, and... I had a blast. So the the this is zero and fives, the one and four bracket. That was my life for like two years, which was great. And I kept going to him because again, this this the social part of it that I really like. Um, but when I now take it a guess a little more serious, or like I want to win a little bit more, I play like better lists and things. Those new players are where I was a couple years ago, and I feel like it is a part of my responsibility as a steward of the game to be able to contextualize what is occurring on this table is not indicative of who they are as players and who they are as people. If you do go to an event, don't expect them to have big prizes. Sometimes you get a box of miniatures or a trophy, which is very cool. The Age of Sigmar event scene isn't what I would necessarily describe as mega professional, especially if you come from something like esports or magic. It has got better. It's improving all the time. And that's thanks to a bunch of hardworking tournament organizers around the world who talk to each other to try and improve events 
all the time. And if you aren't hyper-focused on gaming, but still want to go and meet other people in the hobby, then this is also a great thing that you can do. There are prizes and awards for the best painted, and some people compete for that exclusively. There are also awards and prizes for just being the best sport, which is also something that I think is very important and something you can actively develop as a skill set. There are clubs and teams to be a part of. And this is something Age of Sigmar does very well. Recently, we've seen the rise of a lot of teams, especially with their team jersey and shorts and hats and all sorts of other items of paraphernalia. This has inspired other teams to get more professional with more merch and clout and hobby stores and events, and it's been very fun to see. I'm pretty biased. I think wargaming events are great, and they're getting better all the time, which is also a positive. If I were you, and if you wanted to meet new people who enjoy this specific thing, then I'd get to events because they're very fun. In this part of the video, we were meant to be talking about how to build a list. However, we've kind of talked about the background of Age of Sigmar and how to get into it generally, and we've discussed the playstyle of the armies enough that I think you've got a general idea. It felt a bit weird shoehorning a very technical part of the game into this video, especially as this video probably works even when there's a new edition. So we're gonna make a separate video on how to build a list in Age of Sigmar, and this means I can go into more detail and depth, which is really cool for me, because I really think that there's some very fun stuff about building lists and armies in the game. But in short, very, very quickly, there are two things that you mainly need to know. At the back of a battle tome, there's this thing called pitch battle profiles. This will tell you the points and how many models are in a unit. And then, for that unit, there'll be a war scroll. That war scroll will have most of the information that you need for building an army, and at the bottom, it'll have the keywords. Lastly, when you build an army, the army has special rules. These are called battle traits, and they're located at the front of your book. So you have the army rules, the battle traits, you have the unit rules, the war scroll, and then you have how many of them you can take at the back of the book. Just build a 2,000 point list, have a leader, make sure you have three battle line, and then just go crazy with everything else. Honestly, if you're new enough that you're not sure how to build a list, then I wouldn't worry too much about building a list. That's a lot of front-loaded information and homework you have to do before you can really experience what it's like moving models around on the tabletop. If someone was to come up to me and say, hey Rob, I wanna play Age of Sigmar next week, I wouldn't say, go away and read the book intently. Instead, I'd say, let's meet up, we'll have some drinks, we'll have a laugh, and we'll move some things around and we'll see what you think. Eventually, you have to go away and learn those rules really well, in my opinion, so you can have more fun, but that's not for today. And hopefully, that'll be in a different video in the future. So overall, Age of Sigmar has got a pretty wild backstory. If you're gonna get into it as a fan, I feel like it's something you needed to know. At launch, a threadbare but potentially brave narrative universe and a game system that barely functioned and needed to be rescued by the community that turned into a massive fantasy juggernaut that's taken over the world wargaming scene. Thousands of active gamers all around the world and that's just at events. That's not casual hobby people who are just hanging out at their local gaming store rolling some dice. 26 active and fully realized armies with miniatures, some new and some very, very old. I can't work out why Age of Sigmar became the success that it did. I know it's because the community filled a void which was left by the game company themselves and grew the game to a critical mass that it became viable and then a juggernaut. But I routinely ask myself why those people, myself included, did that. I don't know if it's because of the remnants of the old world, and that can't be true for people who entered the hobby new. Is it because there's something always evocative about fantasy miniatures, or did it genuinely become something unique and of itself? I think the reason I like it, mechanics aside, it's a great tabletop game to play, and I think it's very balanced and well put together as a game. But as a universe and a setting, I think it's evocative because of its revolutionary nature. Again, not by intent, but it's community-led, community-focused, and it's kind of community-designed from the ground up. And there's something intrinsically wonderful about that because it feels like the creators, the creatives, and everyone else inside of the hobby got to explore something new for the very first time, a fantasy world all of their own. And that mirrored the story, and that's 
Cool. Ultimately, you've got to ask yourself if you think that the narrative is bold, if you think that it's a brave new world of fantasy, or if you think it's just stealing off existing tropes. And also, does any of that really matter? I don't know if it does. The game is very, very exciting. The universe, I think, is unique and getting better all the time. The game mirrors the classic fantasy trope of the young farm boy who turns out to be the forgotten son of some noble forgotten hero. Eventually through trial and tribulation, develops skills and background and gets stronger and builds a big following. And then eventually goes through the process of ultimately probably defeating God, which is maybe the final irony for Age of Sigmar, that even though it was a genre busting game system, in of itself, that's a story that's kind of old as time. This is just the intro video. I plan on making loads of high-end content about Age of Sigmar. Hopefully through me and everything that we create on The Honest Wargamer, you'll learn how to play games really well. Eventually, we're gonna deep dive into lore. We don't really need to teach you how to build and paint minis, although there's a very quick way of painting minis called slab chopping. Not sure if you've heard of it. And I'm supported in doing this by everyone on The Honest Wargamer Patreon. So thank you to all of them. Couldn't do it without them. I also don't know what it is that you may wanna learn. It's been so long since I was new, I'm not sure. And I'd love you to tell me in the comments what it is you'd like me to do in the future and what you'd like to learn. And if it doesn't sound like it's for you, then that's okay. Most of the things I said about people and learning to play games, is pretty much true for every other war game. And that's really cool. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I can't thank you enough. And thanks for being honest war gamers.